This is the story of my exploration of the mysteries of Hieronymus Bosch. But first, I need to tell you how my interest in Bosch began. The process of this exploration through the work of this extraordinary and enigmatic painter has for me been a journey in itself, one that started many years ago. I first saw Bosch's paintings in the original in the Prado Museum about 30 years ago. It was my first visit to Spain. I'd gone to the Prado because I knew that paintings by El Greco, Velázquez and Goya were there. I knew that to see them for the first time was going to be a great moment in my life. I had not the slightest idea that any of Bosch's paintings were in Spain, let alone in Madrid and in the Prado. Then one day, I shall never forget it, I think it was my third visit to the museum. I happened to turn a corner in the Flemish gallery and there, to my amazement, came face to face with the garden of earthly delights. Ever since that first moment, when I stood staring at this picture, I've been fascinated by it. I've been trying to understand it trying to work out how it was that Hieronymus Bosch, a painter who lived over 500 years ago, could have produced a painting like this. What I wanted to know was going on in these pictures. Those figures there, are they making love or copulating? Why three? Two might be respectable, three's an orgy. The people in the thistle bubble, what are they up to? And those legs, and those giant birds, if, as some have said, it was an altarpiece, it was a very strange work indeed for a church. I wasn't a professional in the history of art, so naturally I went to look up Bosch in the standard books on painting. To my astonishment, the great Erwin Panofsky not only told me nothing, but he explains quite deliberately why he has nothing to say. The secret of the interpretation of Bosch's strange paintings has, according to Panofsky, not yet been found. We have not discovered the key to them. And Panofsky, with enviable intellectual restraint, says no more except to quote a 16th century German scholar who gave up on quite a different intellectual problem with the words, this too high for my wit, I prefer to omit. For a long time, my curiosity led me to pick up information and opinions from wherever I could. I was living in Spain and had ample opportunity to look at the Bosch paintings. More and more questions were piling up in my mind, but I was finding no answers. Then a couple of years ago, I got the chance to dig into the whole subject of Bosch. I decided to play the detective, to review the theories, new and old, and above all, to follow the evidence and clues that Bosch himself has left us in his paintings. Of the 30 or more of Bosch's paintings that still exist, eight of them include pretty well all the puzzles I found I had to face and solve. The Garden of Earthly Delights itself. The Mystery of Mysteries. The Temptation of St. Anthony, which is in Lisbon. 
the Haywain, another of the Prado collection. And the picture on the outside of the Haywain when it's closed. St. John on the island of Patmos. The peddler, if that's who he is, in Rotterdam. The marriage at Cana. And the adoration of the Magi, one of the few titles you can trust. All the names we have for Bosch's pictures were given them by catalogers. We don't know what Bosch himself called any of them. I first of all looked for areas of agreement among the commentators and historians of art. To begin with, there are details of Bosch's paintings which are recognizably in the Flemish or Dutch tradition. The Virgin and Child in Bosch's adoration of the Magi is stylistically related to Roger van der Weyden's St. Luke painting the Virgin. which in turn follows the tradition of Jan van Eyck before him, with his little figures in the perspective distance, a trick which Bosch uses time and again. And I discovered for myself two pictures astonishingly alike in style and composition, Bosch's and Gerchen Totzinian's St. John the Baptist in the Wilderness. Gerchen was from Harlem, and was about 10 years or so younger than Bosch. There can be no doubt that one artist saw the work of the other. But in the surrounding details of the figure of the saint, Bosch is original, himself, and unlike anybody before him. The second thing that everyone agrees about is that Bosch's painting says, it silently speaks. Beyond those two areas of agreement, there's nothing but argument and controversy. Nearly every commentator is convinced that he has the clue to the mysteries of Hieronymus Bosch. One theory, the most popular, is that he was a member of a secret sect which practiced forbidden rites and orgies and that he painted these practices. Another, that his entire work is based on astrology and can be read with the help of the signs of the zodiac. Another commentator says that every little scene he painted illustrates a Dutch saying or a Dutch proverb. And yet another believes Bosch to be a scholar, painting puns in Greek and Latin. Heresy, witchcraft, alchemy, linguistics, even drugs. Each new interpreter is satisfied with his own explanation. But the fact is, I wasn't. I couldn't accept any of them. Not one of them did I find totally convincing. I believed the answer was more reasonable, less attractively exotic. It was facts I wanted, facts to get at the man and his motives. But the problem is that the established facts about Hieronymus Bosch are intimidatingly few. Even this portrait was done several years after his death. When was he born? Nobody knows for certain. But the likelihood is that it was in the exact middle of the 15th century, 1450 or a couple of years either side. Where was he born? Again, nobody can be sure. But he undoubtedly lived, married, worked and died in a place called Seltorgenbos in the Netherlands, and this film was going to give me the chance of going there. At last I thought I might discover some key to the pictures which had tantalized me for so many years. If I could actually explore the place that they came from, surely I'd find something there to help me. 
Sir Togumbos, or Den Bos, as it's called for short, is in the southern part of Holland, in the region of Brabant. I knew little more about it than its name when I went there, and had no idea what to expect. <laughs> My first reaction was disappointment. I'm not sure what I'd imagined it would be like, but I wasn't expecting such a very ordinary, very commercial, very provincial little town. I couldn't, for the life of me, fit anybody as extraordinary as Bosch into a sleepy little place like this. Whatever sign was there that anything but the most ordinary events could have happened here in any century? The one big occasion of the week is this market. The kind of market you know instinctively hasn't changed in hundreds of years. This one is normally held in the market square. But when I was there, because of road repairs, it was taking place under the walls of the cathedral. It was this great mass of St. John's Cathedral that gave me my first hope. It was the very same church as was being built in Bosch's day. This part of the Netherlands has remained predominantly Roman Catholic, even though long after Bosch died, the greater part of the Netherlands split off from the church and became Protestant. The virgin that is worshipped daily by the town folk to this very day is the same one that Bosch knew. But what had caught my imagination was not the continuity of ritual, but to see the church once again full of builders, restorers this time, getting back some of the original color and giving new strength to the old stone. <laughs> This, I told myself, is a scene that Bosch himself would have witnessed. Not only that, it reminded me that Bosch was a craftsman just like any other in this backwards of the Middle Ages. He was no famous painter like Rembrandt or Bruegel, who came after him. If he had been, records would exist and we'd know a great deal more about him than we do. As a professional, he was on the same level as stonemasons, carpenters, and decorators. These were his contemporaries, craftsmen who carved their own images into the work they were doing for the fine new church they were building. It's curious that Bosch never painted a face and said, that's me. And yet, there's a persistent tradition that we know what he looked like. In 
If you'd seen people going through the streets, you'd have recognized their jobs in Bosch's day. Weavers and fullers in cloth making, saddle makers, cobblers and cap makers, painters, burgomasters, officers, everyone wore his distinctive clothing, his mark of office. Even beggars and street entertainers wore their badges. Begging was a recognized profession in Bosch's day. The deformed, the maimed, the crippled were part of the everyday scene in any town throughout these centuries. And Bosch jotted them down in these quick sketches, just as any other artist would, for future use in one of his paintings. Whatever Bosch's pictures may be about, they depict the life of his contemporaries as one of imminent calamity and misery. Medieval European man was solemn, and smiles weren't exchanged naturally when people greeted one another. Smiling over much was sinful and tears were frequent in church during the telling of tales in ordinary conversation. And to weep was no shame for even the bravest of men. Contrasts were marked. The poor begged in the streets, showed dreadfully maimed limbs and starved in public. The great lived in ostentatious splendor. People spoke loudly and did everything noisily, indoors and out. But by night, all was silent. The streets deserted except for the homeless and the evil. Houses darkened and still. Calamity was bewailed aloud. A cry in the night was murder. A light in the night was arrest. Voices in the night were marauders and evildoers. The unknown and the different was devilry and to be put down. The age was sad, pessimist, expecting evil as man's ineluctable destiny and snatching at joys because they were inescapably short-lived. Hell beckoned and the detailed inventory of its tortures was known, studied, embellished, and brandished before children and adults. Heroic virtue and the intercession of saints might save some, but most, the most by far, were damned. It was real fire that Bosch painted when he wanted to create an image of hell. Fires that he'd seen with his own eyes. Whole villages burning like matchwood. Few of us know the fear of burning in fire eternal. None of us has seen a witch or a heretic burned alive in a public place. Bosch and his contemporaries had. The fires of hell for them were just as real. With details like this, how can we not believe he'd seen the blast furnaces burning through the night, the revolutionary new iron smelting technique near the city of Liège would have been the talk of any town. Liège, the diocesan center for his own church of St. John. 
Now that I was in Den Bosch, I felt more and more convinced that certain things that we find so extraordinary in many of Bosch's paintings were in fact taken from the experiences of his daily life. It was for this reason that I was particularly interested to see a painting showing exactly what the town was like in Bosch's day. Now, this is a painting which is uh, approximately in the time of Bosch, Bosch, you say, but we call him Jeroen Bosch. Approximately, it is dated about 1530. Pieter Hermesdorf, a specialist in the restoration of medieval Flemish paintings, was working on it when I was there. It was painted on wood panel like any of Bosch's paintings. And like Bosch, the artist had used transparent glosses, which was the new Flemish technique of that time. The subject is an everyday subject. The wool market in Sartoven Bosch, then Bosch where Jeroen Bos uh, lived, and the form of it is almost the same as it is nowadays. The market is still there, the fountain will be re-erected. The well underneath it, uh, it has been proved, is still there. For a great part, it is uh, historically true. This, then, is the market that Bosch knew. He would have walked through it to get to his house in this very same square. He had food that was bought here, and wore clothes that came from here, and new houses that stood here. To find out more about the rest of the town that related to Bosch's day, to see what clues might be there, I met Father Gerlach, a Franciscan friar of great reputation among students of Bosch's paintings. In the, time of, in the time of Jeroen Bosch, it was, it was the church. Not, it, was not a, it was not a cathedral. No, it was the beginning was, of the yes, church of St. Church, John's. Church. Yeah. And the church was volended. Uh, where is ended. It? Yes, it was finished. finished. Ended. Finished. Ended. Father Herlach has lived for years in Den Bosch and verified every building that existed in Bosch's day. With him and another medievalist, Father Servus, we wandered through the alleys of the old city and traced the boundaries of the old town. I asked him about the two schools of the Fraternity of the Common Life that were once there, at one of which the great Erasmus studied. I wasn't aware then what a vital clue the existence of the Common Life Fraternity was to prove for me. The other side is the house who where he had his workshop. For the workshop, and yes. where he was with his wife. Very late, eh? yes. Where he getrouwd is geweest, and where he ook gestorven is, hoe is dying. And where he died, in, in, in yes. This house, in the other house. Bizarre as it may seem, looking at the place now, this men's outfitters is in fact on the site of the house where Bosch had lived. Here I was told he'd set up his workshop and lodged his apprentices. The only part of the house left which is anywhere near genuine is the cellars. To my surprise, the owners had never been down there. They even had to force an entry for me. Dry as a bone and cool. Here, I told myself, Bosch would have stacked the wooden panels and the materials for his paints. But that's anybody's guess. It didn't get me any further. The cellar steps led out onto the street. I had to circumvent iron bars and the dirt of ages to get up them. I was back where I began, in the market square. I wanted to see anything that was part of the town when Bosch lived there. So I even explored the disused canals, the network of waterways that goes under the old houses. In that punt by torchlight, 
I was getting something the books couldn't give me, the authentic smell and feel of Bosch's own day. There was a gentle and strangely pleasant smell of putrefaction down there. The silence was tangible. My imagination was taking me into the dream world of Bosch's fantasy. I had to pull myself together and get back to real fact. Start with his name. His real name was Jeroen or Jon van Aken, and his first name was often given in the Latin form of Geronimus or Hieronymus. He used the signature of Hieronymus Bosch, taking as his surname the substantive part of the name of his city. It didn't surprise me to find that even in this sleepy little town, as I'd called it, records went back many hundreds of years. They have a rich library of documents. In them, there are references to his grandfather, Jan, who was a painter, and to his father and uncles, who were painters, and to his brothers, who were also painters. We know that when he was about 30 or so, he married a woman of good family called Aleit van Mervene. We know too that because of whom he married, he became a landowner. Here's an item in the land registry referring to his newly come by possessions. It says, uh, your Frau Aleit van den Mirvene, that's his wife, with Hieronymus van Aken, her husband, registers in the parish of Oerscott, one house, one other dwelling, one hectare of land, another four hectares, and a further measure of two and a half hectares. She because of the distinction of her family, had been made a member of the Brotherhood of the Virgin when she was very young. Now he, because of his marriage, was also inducted into the same Brotherhood. This one Brotherhood, the popular name for the Brotherhood of the Virgin, still exists and has its own building on the same site in the town as the one in Bosch's day. It still remains the Society of Pious Laymen, a distinguished body of merchant patricians whose charter dates back from 1318, though they'd been founded quite a time previously. They organized church services, a choir and processions, and had a chapel of their own in St. John's Church. Their banquets were great occasions and Hieronymus Bosch, after rising to the dignity of a notable among them, presided over their banquets, or, as they said, spread the cloth, at least twice in his own house. A great moment always of their feasts was the eating of one or more roast swan. This is when he joined. Yes, the son of Antonius, Jeronimus, 10 pounds. To join. To join. That's his membership fee. His membership, yes. An old yeah. script. Unen, it's, it's a, a sort of... of um, Lucas van Dyck, um, archivist. Little name. Uh, yes, uh, a nickname, or, nick, a, or nickname, a shortened, nickname, a shortened yes. version of his Jun, name. Yes. Jun den Malder, Malder. Yes, we would we painter. would translate that literally as Jerry the painter. Jerry, see, from his name anyway, Jeron, the painter. And what what more does it say? Well, Lucas Van Dyck produced for me an old membership book, out of which came a curious circumstance about Hieronymus Bosch, a blank coat of arms. The window. Here you see all the shields of the members. It's very curious, Jeroen Bosch. 
is empty here. Did no, he... no coat of arms. No coat of arms, not a at all. Shield and no coat of arms. No. Is he the only one? He's yeah. not the only one. It's possible that the um, the author, the copyist, copyist, yes. uh, did not uh, know the, the arms of Boss. Ah, you think it's, he it's may not, have had arms? It's not arms. proving that he had no arms. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's and a manuscript uh, from 1460. There was also a reference to the fact that when Bosch became a member of the Swan Brotherhood, his head was shaved to give him the tonsure, and he adopted the sort of semi-clerical clothes they all wore. So I'd learned there were two sides to the membership of this club, this brotherhood. One was the religious and charitable activities they were all known for, and two, the social standing you got by being accepted as a member. And that meant, then as now, to say the least of it, being rather wealthy. Bosch took part in the activities of this brotherhood, but at the same time must have engaged, like any other farmer, in arguing and bargaining in the marketplace and trying to make money. Yet in spite of these two associations, there was something in him that made him bitterly angry at the idea of using the whole of life to try and increase worldly wealth. He's saying so in this painting, The Haywain. It's a clearly satirical picture in which he shows the whole world, from pope to emperor to merchants and priests, the common people, everybody chasing after hay. And hay, in biblical and country proverbs, means the vanity and emptiness of money, wealth. People hoard it. People swindle for it. People kill for it. The great of the world just go along with it and take it for granted as their due. And on top of it all, the arts and the muses. They are no better than any of the others. It's unquestionably a personal protest Bosch is making in this painting. At the back of my mind was an idea a memory that Erasmus, in his satirical little book, Praise of Folly, takes up exactly this attitude towards wealth, satirizing people for devoting their lives to chasing after riches. I knew that Erasmus had been influenced by the teachings of the Common Life Fraternity, the same fraternity that I talked about with Father Herlach. Erasmus was more than influenced. In fact, his mind had been formed by them. The city of Den Bosch was known for years, even well after Bosch's death, for its religiosity. One out of every six men in the town was in holy orders of one sort or another. It was that fraternity that set the tone of sincere devotion among high and low, and made that city different from many others. Their aims and purposes, by our standards, were good, decent Christian ideals. They taught an inner piety and frequent reading of the Bible, and incidentally, were against beating children in school. But the one I found amazing, the one that jumped out at me, was their fundamental and virulent dislike of polyphonic music, of counterpoint, the fashionable, over-elaborate church music of Bosch's day, which was beginning to replace the simple human voice of plain song. For them, it led to sin, the work of the devil. I knew I'd seen this in one of Bosch's paintings. If I was right, this fantastic musical section in the hell panel of the Garden of Earthly Delights is Bosch telling us that polyphonic music in church is a sin and a heresy, and that those who perpetrate it and enjoy it will suffer in hell forever.
I'd read at least a dozen complicated and contradictory attempts to explain this strange group. To me, now it appeared straightforward. Bosch is here preaching, using paint to preach the common life teachings. What I had to do now was to test other aims of the common life fraternity against other details in his paintings. If the aims of the common life fraternity fit his pictures, my hypothesis is proved. If I'm right, then this is the evil of drink. His legs are rotten trees standing unsteadily in boats on water. He's the eternal drunk. His body, a rotten egg, is nothing but a dreary tavern. This would be gluttony, not as the books told me, a devil in hell swallowing sinners and defecating them. The sin of greed or gluttony wears a cooking pot on his head. His body is the color and pattern of a common ceramic cooking stove. His hands are the two-pronged fork of the period. His feet are stuck in kitchen jugs, and he sits on a cucking or shitting stool. A glutton is eaten up by his own sin, wastes his money on it, Bosch is saying, and it all ends in vomit. The waste of time and life involved in gaming, yet another diversion from the search for salvation. The inevitable accompaniment, girls' lust. I now believed I was on the right track. If I was right, Hieronymus Bosch was a fierce and pious Christian, a follower of the teachings of the common life, the fraternity which had taught him as a boy, the fraternity which was to teach Erasmus 20 years later in one of the very same schools of Den Bosch, the fraternity whose seminal figure, St. Thomas a. Kempis, has left us that beautiful, pleading little book of advice, The Imitation of Christ. Erasmus the scholar, St. Thomas a. Kempis the gentle mystic, and a simpler, less intellectual man, Hieronymus Bosch, the painter of Den Bosch, were after the same thing. Bosch was in his painting, and I don't doubt in his life, pleading, threatening, cajoling for a return to the faith of the true church. His Gothic, like that of the church he watched going up and prayed in, was still pure and white. I'd started with this Church of St. John, and for me it had become a symbol of the very specific spiritual atmosphere in this town, precisely at the moment of Bosch's lifetime. The people who prayed and worshipped daily here were instilled with the rhythms, the intonations, the words of the Latin Bible.
They were fed sermons, stories, and parables, made to see the characters of the Bible as real people, real people whom they invoked and communed with. The Bible is taught to them by the fraternity of the common life. I left Denbos with a conviction that the fraternity's insistence on the Bible was the main key to Bosch's paintings. I decided to use it, the Bible, on a painting that had been termed a problem picture, St. John on the island of Patmos. No one up till now had told me what this strange creature was doing in the picture. What I found in the Bible fits almost word for word, allowing for the creative license of a man like Bosch. I, John, was in the isle that is called Patmos, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared to battle. Not quite. Bosch has invented one little man type, and he has to do for all the locusts and on their heads were, as it were, crowns of gold. That's the fireball thing on top of the helmet. And their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. No teeth and no hair, and that face looks like the artist to me. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, yes indeed. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. And their power was to hurt men five months. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And there they are. I never noticed that moon until I read those words. It's important to remember that all the names we know for Bosch's pictures are invented by others. Nobody knows what Bosch called any of his paintings. This one has had several titles, the Vagabond, the Peddler, Mankind, the Prodigal Son, and even the so-called Prodigal Son. I don't believe any of them. I see it as the Good Samaritan. There's the man bound to a tree and being robbed. There's the Levite turning aside. And there's the Good Samaritan, about to turn round and give up his journey to save the man. The other very similar painting in Rotterdam carries the same confusion of titles. I've got to admit that the Rotterdam one has so far got me puzzled. Everything seems to concentrate on a tavern brothel in the background, somebody trying to seduce a woman, a man pissing against the wall, a woman looking out of a window straight at us or at the central figure, the whole house falling to pieces. The man in the centre I find very difficult to explain. There's a sort of double symbolism about him. Two hats of different kinds. Why? I don't know. Why one shoe, one slipper? I've no idea, and no one else has provided a complete explanation I can accept. But one thing I'm sure of in this painting is that Bosch used his own face for the man, the face that appears in so many of his paintings. That nose is unmistakable. Proof or no proof, I'm satisfied that's our man. All this time, I'd been trying to build up for myself a picture of a real man, not just a name, 
a man who'd lived in a specific place at a specific time. It's an impossible thing to do, bridge 500 years. But I felt I had to try to understand the man's character through the paintings that were left to us. And I see him as a man of many angers. He's furious at the gullibility of the people around him. Nou begin een stukje merbal, de meeste van u kennen dat wel. U mag dat ook zelfs tegen de draad verwerken. Hoewel dat natuurlijk niet de bedoeling is, maar het is ook gelijktijdig een fantastisch schuurbord. Komt u wat dichterbij, als u wilt, ik bijt niet door. En de meeste van u, die kennen, dacht ik, de naam David wel. U heeft een kwaliteitsproduct waar u altijd fabrieksgarantie op heeft. Ik geef u ook volledig naam en adres erbij. Hier heeft u inzet op de slagschaaf, met aanslag als dat sporingschaaf, schuurzoltjes erbij, twee beteltjes, zes strookjes schuurbord. Het kost normaal 24,90. Ik verkoop hem compleet voor 22 gulden. De reserve bij de, dat u net trok, die kunt u in de hotel... Any tub thumper, any quack he's saying in this picture, is able to deceive us. A trickster in any street at any time. It's called the conjurer. He's full of contempt and not pity for those in their stupid self-indulgent pleasures. The Ship of Fools. It's an old and well-worked theme. All sinners are going to hell. Those dressed as monks and nuns as well as ordinary people. Bosch was obsessed with sin, and into this painting, The Temptations of St. Anthony, he put all the burning passion he had inside him. Here is the great fight against evil. The good man who stands up and defeats temptation, sin, the devil himself. Bosch painted the theme of St. Anthony and his brave fight again and again. Most of the paintings are lost. Anthony was his father's name. The family worshipped at the chapel of St. Anthony in Den Bos. Bosch identified with St. Anthony. He uses the story of St. Anthony, his temptations and his struggle against them. St. Anthony carried up into the sky by devils before they fling him down to us. His friends carrying him back to his cave or to the coffin in which he lived. The saints surrounded by temptations. The devil queen who tried to seduce him. But the real purpose of the triptych is the denunciation of sin. The sin waiting everywhere to trap mankind. The sin which is blasphemy, bewitchery, the devil's doing. Psychology, psychoanalysis, says that nobody could be like Bosch, so obsessed by sin, so obsessed by images of sex, so obsessed by evil, witchcraft and sorcery, and not have it himself deep in him. Of course he had, and he knew it. The very fact that he returns to the same great themes, sin and repentance, again and again and again, proves his obsession with what he considers his own miserable spiritual condition. He was a man of his times, for all of them, the devil was alive and lurked round every corner. The belief in witchcraft was a fearful commonplace. A blasphemous representation of the flight into Egypt, with Mary mounted on a giant rat and stuffed into the hollow of a dead tree.
a blasphemous mockery of the adoration of the Magi, with the black king spread-eagled. Joseph behind Mary in the background as usual. One of the kings petrified, and the third encased in armor. In the air, witches cavort. The devil bending over for his behind to be kissed was typical of a witch's Sabbath. While in the very center of the picture, Jesus points to his own crucifixion, the true way to salvation, a mass, a black mass, is being celebrated. A procession of the filthiest of mankind by the standards of Bosch's day. The crippled in body and the maimed in mind. Jugglers, musicians, dogs and monsters attend the mass, lining up to take a sacrilegious communion. A false priest conducts the false mass. In the Roman mass, the priest gives the people the wafer but never the wine. In this one, he gives the wine. And she who is the spirit of evil is taking up the wafer. The black acolyte elevates a symbol of sacrilege, where in the true mass would be the crucifix. The images of corruption and wickedness are innumerable. Yet, says the story, the mighty power of the goodness of Antony was proof against all this evil. In Hieronymus Bosch's list of the great, the greatest. Super Antony indeed. Bosch loved his countryside more than he knew. His landscapes are distinctively North Brabant, his part of the Netherlands. Like any medieval craftsman, he put in background incidents to fill in the scenes. But being by Bosch, they're often evil. He put in complete little vignettes as though spying on people from far away. In the open-air museum of medieval buildings at Bokrik in Belgium, which is also part of the Brabant region, I've seen buildings which could have come straight out of a Bosch picture. When Bosch wants to, he paints with such attention to detail, it's nearly impossible to see what's real and what's painting. But even a familiar subject, like the Adoration, painted by Bosch, has more in it than a first glance can take in or understand.
Bosch has set the whole scene as if it were the celebration of the Mass. Mary is the altar, the child enthroned on her lap. Balthasar, the oldest of the kings, in his red cloak is the celebrant, and the other two are acolytes. Caspar must be one of the finest figures Bosch ever painted. All round are scattered, sculptured, engraved, and embroidered references from the Old Testament. Again, the Bible is our key. The sculpture on the ground is the sacrifice of Isaac. Melcher's cape is embroidered with the Queen of Sheba's visit to Solomon. Caspar's orb shows Abner offering homage to David. The little figure in the background on the left wing is St. Joseph. He looks up from washing the child's clothes as if wondering what's happening. St. Joseph was often a figure of fun and ribald humor throughout the Middle Ages. Earthy humor saw him as cuckolded of the Holy Ghost and many a solemn sermon argued seriously to refute the slander. The bad shepherds are watching from the roof. They are described in a verse in the Gospel of St. John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. The bizarre figure in the doorway has attracted the most bizarre theories. One of them is he's the Antichrist and at the same time the Jewish Messiah. Another that he's Balaam, the heathen prophet who came to curse and stayed to bless. I suggest that he's King David. He's nearly naked and draped in a red robe. When David danced in exaltation before the Ark of the Lord, the second book of Samuel says, uncovering himself as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. This is another moment of exaltation, the birth of Jesus, who, according to the Gospels, was of the line of David, son of Jesse. The strange headdress with its curious leafy twig becomes no longer strange. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of its roots. The helmet-like crown that King David holds is, I guess, the crown of the kingdom brought by David to the newly born child Jesus. Good then predominates. It is, after all, one of Bosch's most straightforward paintings. This picture, called the marriage at Cana, is a much tougher one to interpret. Nobody offers a complete explanation. It's a puzzle picture. The kernel of the Cana story is there. There are the jars being filled with the miracle water turned to wine. Six water pots in the parable, six stone water pots in the painting. But there's a lot that needs explaining. There are strange things going on in the background. A swan is being brought in, spitting fire. A curious crouched piper in a sort of minstrel gallery. A man gesticulating in the background. The guests are in outdoor clothing. There's a curious little robed figure offering a chalice of wine right in the middle. 
I think it's three separate meals, three Bible incidents. The marriage of Cana, that we know. For the outdoor clothes of the guests, I went to Jesus' parable about the king who had a wedding dinner but no guests. He sent his servants out and made them bring in from the street anybody who was there, both good and bad, says Jesus. And the third incident is the tax gatherer who was so short that he climbed up a tree to see Jesus, and in reward, Jesus promised to come round to his house. Zacchaeus, the little tax gatherer, was rich, which accounts for his ornate robe. He'd be the host. So I make it a composite Bible story. So much I think I found out. But it doesn't yet gel. I can't squeeze out of it that moral lesson that usually comes out of a Bosch picture. The Garden of Earthly Delights. We've come full circle. But don't take the name too seriously. That's not what Bosch would have called it. With the wings open, there's the Garden of Eden on the left, hell on the right, and one of the greatest of all Bosch's mysteries in the center. When the shutters are closed, you see a creation scene. In the top left-hand corner is God looking at a book, and below him, the new-made world. The world is a book written by the finger of God. The book held by God, in my opinion, refers to St. John's creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was made nothing that was made. On the top of the outer wings, Bosch puts in Latin a verse, which in the Vulgate version of the Bible he knew, occurs in identical form in two separate psalms. For he spoke, and they were made. He commanded, and they were created. It seems to me to be only common sense to take the hint and go to both Psalms to see if any other part of them is represented anywhere in this series of paintings. And listen to what you find when you look. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were established and all the power of them by the spirit of his mouth, gathering together the waters of the sea as in a vessel, laying up the depths in storehouses. Gathering together the waters of the sea as in a vessel. Other translations say a flask, a bottle, laying up the depths in storehouses. The fantastically shaped edifices on the skyline are no great mystery, even though most of the commentators find them hard to explain. They are the storehouses of God's wisdom. Why so exotic? Christopher Columbus came back from his first great expedition across the seas when Hieronymus Bosch was about 43 years old. I see them as Bosch's genius playing with the stories going the rounds about what those men had seen. The fantastic fountain at the very center of the Garden of Eden is really no mystery. In chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, it says, But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. The Vulgate, the only Bible that Bosch knew, instead of mist, has in Latin, fons, fountain. And he naturally painted a fountain and not a mist. Bosch places the fountain on a rock encrusted with precious stones. 
and that I found in the book of Ezekiel. The sardius, the topaz, and the jasper, the chrysolite and the onyx, the beryl, the sapphire, and the emerald. Even those little glass tubes are mentioned. Pipes, prepared in the day thou wast created. That's how intimately Bosch follows the Bible. And equally closely, I believe, he follows the spiritual teachings of the fraternity in all his paintings. If I now try to look at the center panel of the picture commonly called the Garden of Earthly Delights, through the eyes of a follower of the doctrine of the common life fraternity at the turn of the 16th century, what do I see? Not necessarily the lewdness and the lechery and lust that jumps out at us in the 20th century. It's not nearly as simple as that. It's naked people acting out the varieties of human wickedness in symbolic terms. Of course they're naked. At the day of judgment, we shall all be denuded of our draperies without our deceits and our hypocritical coverings. If you see mankind as it really is, you see mankind naked. And that's why all judgment paintings show men and women naked. The teaching of the church fathers was that at the last day of judgment, at the resurrection, we shall all come out of our graves in the prime of our lives. Most of us, that is, about 30 years old. And that's why there are no children in the painting. But this is no last judgment, no judgment of God. There's no throne, no divine presence. It is Bosch's judgment. He is denouncing the world for the depravity of its behavior. The whole picture is a catalog of sins in the understanding of the common life teachers. This is the epitome of egoism the concentration in self-indulgence which cuts people off from all else. Birds are evil symbols, and Bosch uses them to attack the corrupt church with all its fine plumage, its indifference, its condoning of wickedness. It indulges sin and is the despair of those seeking for truth. The maddest of beliefs flourish. The craziest of sectarianisms thrive. And Bosch shows them, cavorting round and round, getting nowhere in their frantic anti-clockwise circle. Bosch contrasts the two types of teaching. The theologians enclosed unseeing in the narrowness of their useless argumentations. The cardinal red of their tent signifying the approval of Rome. In contrast to the true schools of simple, clear-seeing faith, the fraternity of the common life itself. The teacher with the mendicant robe the pupil, staring out horrified at the sinful world. Every single detail carries meaning. There's no end to it. And I haven't got anywhere near plumbing it to its depths. For me, this is the correct analysis of one of the greatest pictures ever painted painted by a man whose genius took the form of concentrating in one style the declining strength, the last gasp of the dying Middle Ages. A picture done not for any secret sect, but as a teaching and contemplative work, created for a chapel or private devotional place of some God-fearing Christian. Did his contemporaries understand his work? My guess is that many did, 
and many didn't. But I'm certain that he wanted to arouse curiosity. He wanted people to ask so that they might be answered and thus learn. The symbols are his own. The teaching method is traditional. In Italy, they'd left it far behind. They were worlds away in their thinking and their painting. Leonardo da Vinci, Bosch's exact contemporary, is at a peak of the Renaissance. Bosch was not to know that after he was dead, his imitators used his style as caricature and that his intensely sincere imagery would be called grotesquery and devilry. The inevitable happened. His meaning, except where it was obvious and traditional, was forgotten. His new style was taken up quite brilliantly sometimes by other artists. A print seller with a shrewd eye for what would sell commissioned an artist by the name of Bruegel to do things for him in the new crazy Bosch style that people were ready to buy. Bruegel was drawing Bosch-like pictures for others to engrave 30 years after Bosch had died. Devilry and japes, they called them. And because of them, Bruegel got the nickname of Peter the Clown. Anyone who collected Bosch's paintings, like Philip II of Spain, was thought to have very weird taste indeed. Before long, Bosch was denigrated to a heretic and worse, a bungler. A Spanish poet insults another as you bosh among poets, all devils and buttocks and asses. And then oblivion. Even Bosch the caricaturist was forgotten until almost our own century. And suddenly now, in a new age, with new tastes and a feverish eroticism, Hieronymus Bosch has become more known than in all the centuries. Digging deep down into himself for his images, he struck into the unconscious common to us all. He dredged up symbols and images which make sense today in Freudian and Jungian terms. Poor Bosch, such a good Orthodox Catholic, he wouldn't have liked it at all. Thank <laughs> you.